uh, introduce Dr. Tobias Cohn. His talk will be, Here's Your Mistake, taking a closer look at students' mistakes. Let's give him a big welcome. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps kind of just two words about myself. Um, I started off as a high school teacher and I was trying to get my students to understand how to work in Python. Um, I thought that's really easy because Python is a simple language, so I just tell them how if works and we're good to go. But <laughs> that was so far from reality and I just struggled with all those problems you could imagine. One of those was that I, as a teacher, spent almost all my time helping the students with silly mistakes, saying, OK, you need to put the column at the end of this line, or here you're a comma missing, or whatnot. I was really kind of, of pissed off just solving this, these tiny mistakes that do not matter in the big scheme. So what I did, I started to investigate the problem. I wrote a new environment that um, gives error messages that actually tell you what's wrong. And one thing led to another, and I ended up doing research in Python at Cambridge University. Um, today, I'm going to show you a little bit of, of what I've learned along this, this passage and um, what I've seen students kind of making mistakes. So let's start with the question, what is a syntax error? Probably kind of you all have some idea what that means. You've seen lots of syntax errors creeping up in your code. But I'm arguing that the syntax error you are seeing are not necessarily the same things that students are seeing. So the question then is, where do these syntax errors come from? What's kind of the source? of errors in the first place. And while we are at it, um, what can we do about these errors? Is there any way to make them go away? So let's start by understanding the problem, what we're talking about syntax error. And I start with a very simple exercise. Um, I ask my students, after interviews and for loops and all that, um, write a program that takes a string and counts how many uh, letters E occur in the string. And I think you all know kind of, of how the, the solution should look like. Something around that. Right. You start with a counter at zero, you go through the string, whenever you have counted a letter E, you increase the count. That has a syntax error in it, right? And that's probably what you think of syntax errors. That's what we usually, as, as professionals, see. However, one of my students did something completely different, which is so much simpler. Um, and that was the moment when, as a teacher, I realized, hold on a second, syntax errors for the students it's not just that the students are too stupid to realize how to use Python, it's that they form their own rules, their own mental models of what's going on and trying to use the language. And the problem is that Python here tells you that can't assign to a literal. Um, for a novice programmer, um, there's no assignment there, or at least no visible assignment. So what the so I'm arguing there's a difference between kind of minor mistakes, things like uh, writing just one equal sign um, instead of two equal signs. And if you really have a misconception about how Python or the computer works, or if we put that kind of in a more graphical um, display, the idea is that I want to control a machine. So I need to have a model, a mental model of what machine I have and what I'm controlling. And then there's this transmission of my ideas going to or into the machine. If something goes wrong in that machine, we can either say it's something wrong with my mental model, the misconception, or something wrong with the transmission. So that's just kind of a minor syntax errors. And that's really important for teaching as well because there's much effort going into correct, helping students correcting mistakes. But if we're talking about a minor syntax error, 
you don't have to go and uh, kind of explain to the students really why you need to put two equal signs. It's basically enough to just say you have to do that, it's a rule following. But if we are talking about a misconception, you really have to take the students aside and say, okay, let's talk about what is Python and how does it work. Um, I found that about a third of the mistakes I've kind of looked at are just minor errors that are really kind of students could fix them if they're told what to do. Um, and that's really where Python, I think, is terrible. It just tells you syntax error and that's it. You have to figure it out yourself. To make matters worse, some <coughs> errors are not really visible, some syntax errors. And I just want to show you a few examples of that. I don't know if you see the syntax error. Oh, oh, oh. Right? The thing is, it's absolutely valid syntax. So even though we as humans see, okay, that's a syntax error, that's not supposed to be this way, um, it's valid for all the Python parser. Here's another one, something that I've seen quite a few times from my students. I don't know if you, if you can spot the problem. Actually, they just do how you would say. Um, I want to be x and y larger than z. Oh. But it's doing something entirely different, so this function never works. Even though kind of the, the closeness of Python to natural language suggests that's the way how to do it. Or kind of the third one that's really obvious here. Um, and for us as professionals, it's a question, why would you do so, such a thing? You can see that the else is, is not a kind of properly indented. But for novice learners who really kind of try to, to get a grip to, with Python, this is not as obvious as it is to us. So the question is really, syntax error is not just a thing that shows up in, in your code that says here is something wrong. Syntax error has, has, has instances that you will never see pop up, actually. So the question then is, can we find solutions? And as I said, I spent years um, writing a new parser and um, getting better error messages. Just to give you an example of that, here's an error message um, that's kind of very typical of Python. Um, there's something wrong in the code. For one thing, Python just tells you it's invalid syntax. So what? What's wrong? But even to make matters worse, the problem is not with the spam here. Spam is perfectly fine. We all love it. But the problem is, is in the first line, right? Now, why does Python say spam is wrong? Because after the opening parenthesis on the first line, it just assumes that y equals bar is a named argument to foo and start kind of continuous parsing. And it's not until it encounters spam that it thinks, OK, I need a comma at this point or a closing parenthesis. But for a student, the computer just tells you spam is wrong. And that's very hard to figure out. So I try to, to kind of improve on that. And that's kind of the error message that you get with my um, new parser. It really kind of looks at all the, the parentheses you have in your program and figures out how do they have to match. And then we can actually tell students what's wrong and implicitly also how to fix it. Also, kind of the uh, example we just saw before, um, if you have a for loop, the error message should tell you that a for loop needs a variable, nothing about assignments. There is no assignment here. And finally, kind of a last problem that really is very, very common with um, beginning students, not writing to parentheses to call the function. The very bottom here, square, needs a parenthesis to actually call it. And, and that's kind of very irritating because no matter how often they, they click on play at the, at the top, um, the code never seems to execute. The computer just does nothing. There's no error message or whatnot. And so I actually have gone even a step further and not just saying, OK, I want to find the syntax errors that Python itself would tell you kind of this is invalid syntax, that's something wrong with your program. I also try to, to catch 
syntax error of this of the hidden kind that you normally wouldn't get but um, still are kind of important for, for learners. So does it work? Yes, it works very, very nicely. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> there are a few, a few things to say. First, um, kind of my main goal has been reached. I didn't spend my time anymore just telling the students where to put a dot or a comma. I could spend my time telling the students how to solve real problems in, in the classroom. And that's what, what I was aiming for, and I've got lots of teachers telling me the same thing. So that part, yes, it works. And you remember perhaps from, from before that um, I have a one third um, or just this kind of small mistakes. And that's really what I was aiming at. Let's get rid of this one third. Students should, should be able to, to correct them on their own. And here's where the but comes in. Um, students' understanding of programming is extremely brittle. Um, just here's one of kind of I, I just show you a few examples of the data set I collected from students. Um, name as is not defined. Now you can see it's just kind of a, a question of case. So they wrote the capital S below where it should be a, a small s. And here's the question: How do you correct the code? I mean, of course, you just write a small s or, or a capital S, so you just have to be consistent and everything is <coughs> teaching. This is what the student did. So you can see, instead of, of correcting the, the variable, um, the student just replaced it by the value um, he or she wanted to have in the code. Which, for, for us, it's not really clear why, but it shows, okay, they have not really understood the problem, they just know what they want to happen, and they, they use whatever means they, they know. Another example is this here, um, since I'm using lots of turtle graphics in my beginners classes, um, you see lots of turtle graphics here. So, you have to indent the block here, and of course we've talked about that time again, so that should be clear what to do. Here's the answer from the student. <laughs> I mean, it solves the problem, kind of, right? And kind of my favorite one, the one I just showed you um, seconds before. Um, here I, I said um, my, my environment tells you you need parentheses to call the function. Yeah. It's the solution <laughs> of the student. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's kind of a single case, that's not all students doing that. But it shows you that even if, if you try very, very hard to tell them kind of how to solve things and give explicit error messages, that doesn't really mean that students then know how to correct their code. Because actually, um, as I said, their understanding of what's going on is still kind of forming and new. And whenever they encounter a problem, it's very easy to just go back to what you already know works. And I don't know, perhaps the teacher here might, might agree with me, the real pain in teaching is often to get students to go beyond what they already know and not just use kind of what they have seen before, but say, okay, this is a new tool and I want to use that tool because I see it makes life easier in the long run. The second thing I was talking about or thinking about is can we do something about the misconceptions about what students kind of have in their head about how Python works and how computers work. And the one thing that I really looked into it are variables and assignments. And kind of I have one question, I simplify here things a little bit because the code otherwise would blow up. Um, the thing was more or less, um, if you take the square root of a negative number, you just get kind of value error or something like that. You can also do that with uh, division by zero or whatever. So I told students, um, write a program that goes and tests before computing the square root whether the number is positive or negative or whatnot, and then kind of decide, do I want to output the square root or do I want to output an error message that tells me um, this is not possible. And this is what kind of a third of the students gave me. And it shows quite a few things here. Um, 
One of them is that even as, as a concept as simple as sequence is not obvious to learners. What's, what's kind of for us is absolutely clear that in a computer program you execute one statement after the next, but that's not kind of, of directly obvious to students. And when I explored that further, I, I found kind of the reason for that being mathematics. In mathematical reasoning, this is actually what you would do. You say, okay, I have this x, that's what I start with. I say that y is the square root of, of x. But just writing on your piece of paper y is the square root of, of x doesn't really do any computation mathematics. It just establishes the relationship between x and y. So, from a student's perspective, kind of what they're doing here is, is, is correct because they define how x and y are related. Then they check what they, they're supposed to be uh, supposed to do, and if actually they can compute it, they say print it. I then kind of prompt it with another example um, to, to see if, if that's persistent. And that's an example I then use for my teaching. The question is. What image does the turtle draw here? So I have s equals 1, t is 3 times s plus 1, and then I repeat 4 times forward t left 90 and increase s by 2. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just a square. But again, kind of a third and half of the students will tell you that's a spiral because t is, is increasing, so, so it's kind of getting larger. And that's actually how I teach that thing now. now. Um, that I start with that and ask the students, what is your guess of what's happening here? And then they have kind of, of really written down their idea of what's going on. So I can use cognitive dissonance and say, OK, but let's use computer and look at what's really happening. And they, they see, OK, that's a square. They have kind of this spiral. Where's the problem? And that's kind of, of how I then start to say, OK, let's really look at what is a variable and how are they different from mathematics. So I really make it explicit and, and say, hey, the term variable or function is something completely different in mathematics and computer science. And you have to be aware of, of that. So kind of to, to summarize that, um, students just, they use mathematical reasoning by saying that y is square root of x is, is kind of established the relationship. Um, in computer science terms, we would say they assume lazy evaluation. They think that a variable just gets evaluated when it's really used or required. Um, and it shows us that even kind of a simple concept as variables can be very, very difficult for, for beginning um, students. And what I think is very important is that we make it explicit and discuss it in teaching, that we really kind of, of take the students to us and say, well, this is the difference, that it works differently to than how you might expect. So, wrapping up. Kind of the three questions I had in the beginning. What is a syntax error? Um, I hope I could show you a little bit that kind of what we see as syntax error on the screen is just kind of a tiny portion of what's really wrong out there. Kind of there are syntax errors you, you can't see if you just take Python's uh, compiler and then rely on that. Um, where do errors come from? Well, kind of I, I really simplified that, but on the uh, grade scheme, um, you can say it's either a misconception where you really kind of, your idea of how computers or programming works is flawed, or it's just kind of a small typing error. And my thesis is more or less to say, well, as long as you can tell students how to correct the typing errors as you point them, them out by, by the tool, you don't need to care about them go and think about misconceptions so that students learn to think properly about computer science. Um, and also answering the third question, what can we do about the errors? I think by separating it into uh, groups and saying, let's have a tool that tells us uh, with real syntax errors how to correct it, and then take teaching to address misconceptions. Thank you very much.
very much. Uh, do we have any questions? Is your parser open source? Is it available? Um, it's not open source, it's just freely available, so you, you can just download it as, as kind of it's a programming environment uh, based on Chiton. Um, but I didn't do it um, open source at this, this point in time. What's it called? Uh, Tiger Chiton. Um, let me write that down. I think that might be a little bit easier. Type with Jyson. Not so easy, doesn't it? Another question here? Yeah, can I ask, does it check? whether or not they've actually called functions. I was looking at that square one, I think the problem I see quite often is not, sometimes I see the missing brackets, sometimes I see they've done def square, and that's it, they haven't called square. Um, not yet at this point. The, the, I was looking into that. The problem is that if you do that, um, you quickly run into situations where you have kind of some functions in your code from, from all, for other reasons, for instance, if you have a module, and if you then say, okay, you have functions that are not called here, uh, that might not really be an, an error or a mistake. So yes. it makes it very, very hard to actually reliably say this is an error. So kind of, of I'm, I'm looking, I, I have at the moment about 20,000 student programs I'm still have to, to go through, um, and kind of trying to find ways how to, how to address that. I'm aware of the problem, I, I have the same thing, but I haven't really found a good way to address it so that it doesn't kind of make yeah. invalid all the programs where it needs to be. Yeah, because it's worse than useless, so it tells you a wrong yeah. error. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Question? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, I imagine that you have seen a lot of student programs with, with, with errors. Um, mm -hmm. Is there something you collect systematically or just from your observation? And if you do it systematically, is there an available data set about student errors that could be used for further research into it? Um, so what I did is, is my program, the title chart environment, has an option that you can say submit all the, the programs and errors to, to a server. So I, I kind of heavily anonymize all that stuff and, and so I have a huge kind of collection of, of raw students errors in the, in the vicinity of 20,000 at, at the moment. Um, I've just gone through 4,000 at the moment, so um, and it's very kind of slow work, um, as you can imagine. But um, I mean, if, if you're interested to, to collaborate, I'm, I'm happy to to exchange ideas or, or the data set or whatever. But um, I'm a little bit kind of concerned of, of really open sourcing a data set like that and make it public. So if you're interested, to get in contact with me. I'm, I'm happy to, to share it. Um, um, one of your examples, I was thinking there was maybe two or three possible suggestions for the fix. Mm -hmm. Do you prioritize your, on probability, what you think most likely fixes? In certain cases, I do. So, kind of, what are the first stage of the pass, it goes through the entire program and um, creates the statistics of all the uh, names that occur in the program. So if you kind of, of misspell a name or something, um, it tries to figure out what's the most likely solution to, to fix it. So, for instance... Um, You're doing a fuzzy matching and saying possibly that's the solution. We can't see what type of thing is. Oh, um, okay. Ah, oh, okay, so you couldn't see, okay. Um, let me try to... So the thing is, um, if I see something like um, it's indeed hard to, to type without seeing it. So um, if you see something like that in your program, there are several ways how this this define uh, what the, the students could have, have meant. So what the parse does, it, it looks at if there's a colon at the end, it assumes that actually you have a space missing. You want to do something like that. But it might be wrong. So it looks at kind of the, the statistics of all the names. And if you have something like that, if that really is the error, you can assume that kind of this, this INA here um, should occur somewhere else in the program, because otherwise, why should you define a function and then never use it? So in that sense, yes, I, I do kind of use statistics in order to, to find probable cor um, correct
fractions. Otherwise, um, the example I showed in the beginning with a uh, uh, foo and bracket open, if you can't figure out where to put the closing bracket, it just tells you um, there's an open bracket without matching closing bracket. Otherwise, it will tell you to put the closing bracket at this point. Yeah. Uh, have you looked at the, I think it's GCC9 introduced a lot of um, error messages, so all, tracking what you're doing, where it's suggesting the fix. Um, no, I, I did have, I just looked at a Python um, concerning error messages. I haven't really looked at uh, C++ or something. Um, I looked a little bit at Java, but um, only really on this um, surface. Yeah, you're not alone on this journey. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I know that, yeah. Yeah, well, thank yeah. you. Yes, yes. Do you want a question there? Uh, yeah, so you've got it as an IDE. Have you got it in such a way that I could run it on a pre-existing Python file and give me some hints of what might be wrong? Um, no, not at the moment. Um, what I do, have, kind of, what I manage is, is one of my master's students um, just wrote uh, the same IDE for for the web. So kind of based on Sculpt, um, where um, yeah, you can can use it's a web to to program Python. And I managed to cross compile my thing to, to kind of a JavaScript library so that um, you can kind of put that into your project. Yeah, that's really cool. I have to talk to you about it. Yeah. Okay, let's say big thank you one more time. <laughs>